the year 2000, you really couldn't put a child in special education for one of these, what I like to call Wall Street disorders. And I call them Wall Street disorders because the drugs that come with these diagnoses are publicly traded on Wall Street for profit. And the companies that sell these drugs are actually some of the biggest donors to the American Psychological and American Psychiatric Association. When I tell you that psychology is a business, I need you to understand what I mean. When I tell you that special education is a business, I need you to understand what I mean. And when I tell you that ADHD is a business, I need you to understand what I mean. Now let's look at this thing called ADHD. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. In 1980, there was no ADHD. In nine, excuse me, let me back up. Well, no, that's correct. In 1980, we had ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder. Between 1980 and 1990, ADD was eliminated. There is no more ADD. So if someone tells you the child has ADD, then they don't know what they're talking about because it doesn't exist no more as a diagnosis. Now it's only ADHD, and it comes in four types, primarily hyper, primarily inattentive, combined, a child is hyper and inattentive, and then the fourth category, which I don't like at all, which is ADHD NOS. NOS means not otherwise specified. That means that the child did not meet the clinical definition of ADHD, but you can legally still diagnose them with it if you think they have it. And that's the slick little category that was created to make sure that if you want the kid on drugs, they can get put on drugs. Now, I refer to ADHD as ain't no daddy at home disorder, because that's really what it is. Ain't no daddy at home disorder, ADHD. Now you say, why do you say that? Well, let's look at the statistics. At least 75% of black boys diagnosed with ADHD or conduct disorder, or oppositional defiant disorder, or disruptive behavior disorder, don't have a father figure in their life. So is this really about psychiatry? Is it really about brain chemistry? Or is it really about a hustle on the backs of fatherless boys? Let's look at the year, 1980. That's when we first get this ADD phenomenon, which later became ADHD. Was it a coincidence we got it in 1980? No. That's the same year that mass incarceration took a turn for the worse. That's the same year that the CIA, Cocaine Import Agency, dropped crack off in the black community. So, in essence, they started drugging the adults at the same time they started drugging the children and with the same type of drugs. Now, you're led to believe that the legal drugs are safer than the illegal drugs. But when you study the history of psychiatric medication, you find that all of the illegal drugs used to be legal. Every one of them was sold as a legal prescription in this country. And the companies that make the illegal drugs also make the legal drugs. And according to the Drug Enforcement Agency of America, DEA, Ritalin is classified as a Schedule II drug, which means it's in the same category. And I want you to do your research. Don't take my word. Because a lot of what you want to hear today is the first time you're hearing it. So you may doubt it. That's okay. I want you to doubt it. Now go find out for sure. Ritalin is classified in the same category as opium, and cocaine as a Schedule II drug by the DEA, which means it's one of the most addictive and one of the most dangerous. Now, people who are chemically dependent, grown people, adults who are addicted to crack and heroin, they can only afford to get high maybe once a day, maybe twice, maybe all the time for a couple of days until their money runs out. But when you're 
a child, when you're a black boy, you don't ever have to worry about the drug running out because there's an endless supply of it. So you get to take it for breakfast, you get to take it for lunch, and you get to take it for dinner. Some of our young men are on three and four different drugs at the same time even though they're contraindicated with each other. What do I mean? You ain't supposed to take some drugs with other drugs. Are y'all following me? But psychiatrists prescribe it anyway. So they might take a certain drug for ADHD, Ritalin. They might take Prozac for depression. They might take Risperdal for anger. A cocktail of medicines. But one of the points I want to drive home today for you all here, is that this war against black boys, this psychoactive holocaust, could not and would not happen were it not for your permission. You parents are complicit in the war against your children. When my phone rings, Dr. Umar, can you help me? My son was diagnosed as mentally retarded, and I don't think he is. Well, if you don't think Raheem was ever retarded, why did you let him get tested in the first place? If you don't think Roxanne was learning to say it, why did you let him get tested in the first place? If you don't think your grandson or foster child has ADHD, if you don't believe in drugs for children, why did you let him get tested? See, I cannot test without your permission. So for every child in special ed who don't belong, Every child diagnosed with a disruptive behavior disorder that they don't need. And every child on dangerous psychiatric medication would not be on it, would not be in the program, had not some Negro parent somewhere gave their authority over to the system. And this system of miseducation is the same system that is controlled by the same people that control the mass incarceration system. Now, isn't it interesting that only one out of every four black boys in America graduates from high school? Isn't it interesting only three out of every 100 black baby boys born in this country will ever see the inside of a college? You mean to tell me that your child is already receiving an inferior education, but you want to make it even worse than what it already is by giving them an IEP, inferior education program? Now, when you put your child in special education, people are not telling you that by the time it's almost time to graduate, he may not be functional on grade level. He may not be ready for college level work. He may not even be ready for trade school. He might not even be ready for a job. I need y'all to understand something. The state of Pennsylvania passed a mandatory graduation examination law that goes into effect in 2015, 2014 or 2015, I think it's 2015. Your child is going to be given 10 tests during the course of their high school career. They must pass six of the 10. I hope y'all listen. If they fail more than four of those 10 sets of assessments, they will not get a diploma. It doesn't matter if they were straight A's and B's. It doesn't matter if they were on their own. It doesn't matter if they were National Junior Honor Society. If you fail that graduation test, you will not get a diploma. Now you know why Pennsylvania is building four new maximum security prisons right now. There's a design to this whole thing. Have you been paying attention to the immigration bill? Do you know what the immigration bill is about? Well, let me take you back in history. Because everything that happens now happened before. In 1890, at the end of Reconstruction, the United States government influxed 20 million non-African immigrants they came from Mexico, they came from East India, they came from Arabia, they came from China to work on the railroads and work in the factories as part of the booming industrial revolution. Now at 
the time they were bringing these black folks, excuse me, these non-black folk in, there was four million ex-slaves who couldn't find jobs. So black people were looking for work, but couldn't find it. But the government was bringing in workers from other countries. Why are you bringing in workers? We got a bottle of water or a cup of water back there, if I could get it. Why are we bringing in workers if we got black people who can't find work? Because America made a mistake during slavery. Although slavery was a tremendous benefit, it came at a big risk. American capital rested on the blacks of black people during slavery. That means black power was the foundation for white power. In freedom, the government said, we can never do that again. Because if you put our economic order under the control of blacks, excuse me, my brother, If you put white power on the back of black power, if black people organize, they can shut down American capitalism. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace the black worker with somebody else. Because if we bring the Chinaman to America and he gets out of line, we can send him back to China. If we bring the East Indian to America and he gets out of line, we can send him back to East India. If we bring the Mexicans to America and they get out of line, we can send them back to Mexico. But black people built this country. There's no place to send them, which is why we got to be careful. They brought those workers in to replace you. And guess what, black people? They're doing it all over again, 130 years later. The entire immigration bill is about making sure we got enough people to replace the Negro once we finish locking them all up. The immigration bill is about you, and you don't even realize it. It's about making sure capitalism can continue without the Negro. You don't need jails when you got jobs. And anyone who studies criminology and sociology knows what? Whenever crime goes down, it's because jobs went up. And whenever jobs go down, crime goes up. 75 years ago, the people who were selling drugs and hustling whiskey and running rackets and breaking the law were not black. They were Irish. They were Italian. They were Jewish. There were Southern European immigrants who were not yet considered white and as a virtue of that were shut out of the American economic order so they broke the law to take care of their families. Nobody said it was because they had ADHD. Nobody said it's because they had a DNA that predisposed them to kill other people. But whenever we talk about black crime, y'all let people brainwash you into thinking that our young men out there know what they're doing because they was born to do that. Violence takes place within the socio-economic political context. Violence takes place within the socio-economic political context. What does this have to do with school? Everything. Everything. Because of the psychoacademic war against black boys, you must first do what? Miseducate. Miseducation is key. It is primary. You must miseducate them first, and then you can psychiatrically medicate them. And then you can do it out and incarcerate them. And then you become psychologically frustrated, which leads to stage five. The final chapter. Premature extermination. One out of every four black men in America killed by their 35th birthday at the hands of another black male, usually trying to do what? Get their hustle on. Economics. One of the weaknesses of us as a people is that we love to celebrate our cultural history, failing to realize that part of African culture is an economic foundation. 
And when you look at many of our movements, some of them had no economic program, although they were great. And the ones that did have an economic program wasn't able to sustain it after the founder of the movement died off. Our weakness is economic power. Kwanzaa's coming up, and we're going to celebrate Kwanzaa for seven days. But are you aware that Macy's department store makes more money off Kwanzaa than all black bookstores in America put together? Kwanzaa comes around and then McDonald's, you got white employees wearing kente cloth to sell you cancer burgers. We're the only people who let other people exploit our culture for their capitalism. You will never see McDonald's workers walking around with Hanukkah stuff on because it's considered a mockery. But with black folk, you can take our cultural icons and sell it. And we have to stop falling short of demanding from our leaders and organizations a solid economic program. We have to have one. If you don't put black people to work, you are not solving black problems. We can talk about a moral fiber all you want, but morals goes out the window for anyone who doesn't know what tomorrow will bring. Right now, in America, especially in Philadelphia and Chicago, public schools are being shut down. Not just here, all over the country. I just came from Los Angeles, shut them down. I just came from Jackson, Mississippi, where the mayor of the city, Attorney Chipway Lamoba, many of you, one of our greatest attorneys of all time, who helped fight for Tupac Shakur and Asada Shakur. He was elected mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. And I was honored on September 19th, he actually made September 19th Dr. Umar Johnson Day in Jackson, Mississippi. Now, I'll never get that here in my hometown because you know Philadelphia is bourgeoisie crazy. And we got the strongest black bourgeoisie in America. In fact, the Boule, the Black Male Secret Society, of which W.E.B. Du Bois was a founding member, was started right here in Philadelphia. So when you talk about the elitist Negro, this is the home of it, which helps explain why we have made so little progress, even though we are the only top 10 city in America in terms of population and power, where the black population equals the white, and yet we have accrued no benefit from our numerical power. No other top 10 city can claim to have as many blacks as white folk, except Philadelphia, with nothing to show for it. I'll be on Word 900 today at 5 o'clock if you want to listen in on the Islam Today show. We're going to talk about a lot of things that I don't get to talk about today. And I'm not going there that often either for the same reason. <laughs> but the reason the schools are shutting down all across America, and especially in Philadelphia and Chicago, is because public school was starting to make sure big business had an educated worker. When you study compulsory education in America, you're going to find out that it was business that went to the government that said you need to give these people a basic education so they can come and work because right now I'm losing money because I got to take time off to teach them how to read, write, and count. The government should be doing that. So compulsory education was born to feed capitalism. But what happens when there's no more jobs for black people? What happens when you're not interested in hiring black boys and black girls and black men? There's no need for a school if you don't have a job. So they get rid of the public schools because your future is in prison, not in the public sector. So the schools are being done away with. In fact, there's a movement in Washington, D.C. to eliminate the United States Department of Education. Why? Well, first of all, it's only been around since 1981. It's not that old. And I need all y'all to know that the Constitution does not give you nor your child a right to an education. The word education isn't even mentioned in the Constitution. If you think I'm wrong, go get the document and read. I'm a political science major. It doesn't deal with education. So you don't have a right to learn. 
And so there's a lot of people in this country who don't understand why their tax dollars is going into the inner city to educate black folk. Spend that money somewhere else. Besides, we're not going to give them jobs anyway, so why are we wasting our time in this? That's why we have a mandatory graduation law. To make sure our sons don't get a diploma now. And once the public schools shut down altogether, you're going to see a mass incarceration campaign like nothing you've seen yet. Look at how they lock up our men now. Went to school. Imagine what's going to happen when you at work from 9 to 3 and your son ain't got nothing to do at all. What you want to do? Ten years ago at the African American Museum downtown, I prophesied that public education would be a thing of the past. People called me a conspiracy theorist. And now my theory has come to pass. Public education is over. They barely opened up the schools this year. And the only reason why they're not shut already is because public education provides tens of thousands of jobs to middle-class white women who got mortgages they need to pay. That's the only reason why the schools are open in Philadelphia. Not so the child can learn, because most of them aren't learning. It's so white women can pay their mortgage and card notes. Which is why I'm working to build the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey RBG Leadership Academy for African American Boys and Girls. I'm not opening a charter school. I'm not interested in a charter school. People ask me all the time, why don't you just get a couple of charters? No. I don't have anything against them. Some of my good friends are principals and CEOs of charter schools. But I do understand the bigger picture of why they were allowed to be created. I know that charter schools were started in 1990 by white women in the middle of nowhere to defund public schools. I know why Philadelphia has the most charter schools in America. This is the reason why you have the most schools being shut down in America. Because for every charter school that opens, you shut down two public schools. And ultimately, you get to a point where you got all charters and no public. So what happens to the black boys that nobody wants? Your child is in a charter school. And if they're in the right charter school, they get a good education. But well, what about somebody else's child who won't be accepted into that charter school? Because you know charter schools have the right to kick out the children they don't want. They send them back to the neighborhood school. So what about all the black boys who nobody wants to be bothered with? Are we thinking about them or are we only worried about your child? If we only worried about your child, you fine. They'll get into a charter. You make them do their homework. You spend time with your baby. You love them. You care. They're going to be all right, but I'm worried about the half yes. yes. They're not going to be all right. That's right. And the school district is passing out charters like free cheese. Yes. Let me explain it to you like this. Let's say Dr. Umar applies for three charter schools in Philadelphia. They give me three charters for 500 students per school. First charter, charter school number one. My school got 500. Those 500 students got to come from your child's public school. So let's say I get 250 from this public school and 250 from this public school. Do you know what they want to say up in Harrisburg? And your state reps and state senators ain't doing a damn thing about it, by the way. Most of them are being poor. They're going to say it doesn't make any sense to keep public school A open because public school A was built for 700 students and we only got 200 in there. Public school B was built for 600 students. We only got 300 in there. So why don't we redistribute those kids, shut down those two schools, and sell them to white developers coming in from other cities who don't have to pay taxes for 10 years and turn that public school into a mini mansion or a strip mall, raise the property value on your house, put grandmama on the street, for a house she bought 30 years ago because she's on fixed income and they know what she makes. So now grandma is homeless and the whole neighborhood is gentrified and bought up by white people. And you wonder what happened. Did you know it all started with the charter school? Dr. 
the Umar's charter school shut down your public school. That public school is now available for white takeover. The white folks buy the public school, turn it into something expensive, raise the property value, push you out your neighborhood, and bring the whites in. Gentrification is using charter education as the great deception. That's why I'm not applying for the charter. Furthermore, I don't want the school district of Philadelphia supervising what I do. Because a charter school is still a public school. When I open up the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy, I don't want your son's IEP. I don't need to see it. Unless he's autistic, blind, or deaf, if he's moderately severe retardation, then I need to see it. But if he got an eval for ADHD, you can keep that home. Conduct disorder, keep that home. Those pills, keep that home. That reading disability, keep that home. Because I know most of our children who are diagnosed with learning disabilities do not have a problem learning. It's the teachers who got a problem teaching. We blame the children for the failures of the system. I need y'all to understand, when I sit down and teach your child, please understand this. The test does not diagnose. The test gives me numbers. That's it. I do the diagnosis. So when someone say he's emotionally disturbed, that's their opinion projected, projected on your child. It's not a fact of reality. When someone says he got mild mental retardation, the test didn't say that. He said it. The test don't diagnose. So when you say, Dr. Umar, you got a test for math disability? Do you got a test for reading disability? Do you got a test for ADHD? There is no test for disability. We give out the disability. Which is why I tell you not to let your black children be tested by people who are culturally different. And I'm not going to sit here and say that every white person got it out for black children. But I do know this. I used to be a school psychologist for the school district of Philadelphia until I quit. And most of my white psychologist uh, co-workers was racist as hell and would tell you in a minute, I don't diagnose those children as mentally gifted. And that's why you have so few black MG kids in Philadelphia. One of them said it at a conference on City Line Avenue in front of the director of school psychology for the school district. It didn't get in trouble, didn't get written up enough. These are people testing their children with special ed. They have a bias. And what you trying to get out of an IEP anyway? I know, SSI check. You want to hustle your child just like the system. Right. So now everybody can be black children. Right. Psychiatrists get paid, therapists get paid, TSS workers get paid, mobile therapists get paid, behavior specialists get paid, case manager get paid, school district get paid, and now mama can get paid. That's why I wrote my book. And I hope you all, if you're raising a black boy, you can't afford not to buy my book. Yeah. I'm not selling it. I'm telling you that it's the only book ever written, ever, do your research, by a black male school psychologist, not educated. I'm that too. But educators don't evaluate, so they can only tell you so much, but they don't do what I do. But by a psychologist that tells you how special education works, how ADHD works, but more importantly, what the hell you can do about it. I got a chapter in that book on frequently asked questions, telling you how to deal with everything they throw at you. For my mothers, I got a chapter in that book on how to deal with disruptive behavior without no medication. You don't need Adderall, Concerta, Meditate, Cycler, or Ritalin in order to teach your child how to behave. You know what you need? Good old-fashioned discipline. The kind you got from your parents. You notice none of y'all was on ADHD meds. Because your father, you couldn't come home and say that. Daddy, I have some trouble paying attention. Can I get some meds? Daddy, I think I got a conduct disorder. I cursed my teacher out today. I had no control over my mouth. You couldn't get away with it. These disorders were created out of single parenthood to hustle the fact that our 
others are doing the best they can. And sisters, I don't blame y'all for your son not being the way he needed to be. I believe all the men in your community who saw you struggle and didn't offer to help with that young man. That's who I blame. People are so quick to say, where's his mother? I don't want to see his mother. Because I already know she's single and doing the best she can. Show me the men on the block who saw her struggle, saw him on the corner, and didn't pull his coattail. Parents are not responsible for their children by themselves. The community is. But where in the hell is the community? I got a lot of respect for Canaan Baptist Church because they're one of the few churches I see around the city that actually cares and gets involved in issues affecting our young people. But we got some other ones who are hustling Jesus money and we ain't getting nothing out of them. The black church gets $3 million every Sunday in America. $3 million, 52 Sundays a year, but where is it? That means every church should have a school, especially the mega churches. Y'all should have five or six schools. And some of y'all don't even realize it, but your Jesus money on Sunday, not at Canaan, but in other places, your Jesus money is actually financing the white takeover of your neighborhood. Let me tell you how. Your church keeps their money in a white bag. So that money you put in the pot goes into a white bank Monday morning. Not up to God, but to a white bank. That white bank takes black people's Jesus money from Philadelphia and give a loan to a white developer to come into Philadelphia and buy up a whole city block, redevelop it, and raise the tax base. Now your mother goes to the church. Grandma puts $100 in every Sunday. But grandma has no idea that when she gets kicked out of her house because of eminent domain, that it was actually her Jesus money that put her on the street. Every black church should have their own savings and loan institution. Are y'all listening to me? Yeah. Even if the money is together, it still works against you unless it's in your holding pot. If you put a million dollars in a white bank, that's a million dollars more they got to hammer away our neighborhood and take it. That's why we gotta have black banks. People want us to feel bad. They go around and say, well, black people are lazy. Look at the Koreans and the Chinese and all these other people. They come to Philadelphia and they only been here three years and look at them, they got stores and supermarkets. You people been here since the beginning of the time. Philadelphia was one of the first colonies to abolish slavery. Why don't y'all have anything when y'all been the longest free? I'll tell you why. Because in order to build anything, you need access to capital, access to money, access to credit, access to collateral. We don't get that from white banks. You have a business idea. You want to open up a daycare center, preschool. You want to open up a school to teach young men how to be electricians and plumbers. Some of y'all got an idea that could probably rival iPhone and iPad and Xbox and the laptop. But unless you got the money, to put your dream into practice, it stays a dream. And that's why the Korean is running faster than you. That's why the Mexican is running faster than you. Not because you're lazy. Some of you owe them two or three jobs. How the hell can you be lazy? It's because they get access to capital. So when they get off the boat, and every time you go to the bank looking for a loan, no, no, no. And if they give you one, it might be for $10,000, small business loan. But the Korean can get a $500,000 big business loan. So how do we get out of that? Black folk got to come together, put our money together in our own savings and loans and institutions and our own banks. You got to have that. At the time of his death, the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey was working on a black bank because he knew that in order to build black economic power, we got to have access to money that we control. I cannot control how y'all spend your money. 
but I can convince you to keep it in the same pot until you spend it. Look at this room. In this room right now, you got no less than $10 million in annual salary in this room right now. Just y'all. $10 million. With that money sitting in the same place with interest, we can all get the loan we need to realize whatever dream we got. But until black people put black dollars together, we'll never get anywhere. I need us to stop settling for cultural symbolism and put some damn substance behind it. We quit with the substance. We're throwing in our shiggy, lock our head, change our name to King Tut. But don't own nothing and happy that you don't own. The meek shall inherit the earth. He wasn't talking about capital. Blessed are the poor. He didn't mean with money. Some of us are allergic to money because we've been conditioned by our parents to think that it was the devil's work. Having money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Let me tell you what the root of all evil is. Not having no damn money. When you walk into your car 10 o'clock at night, are you scared of people with money or are you scared of people without none? The root of evil is not having no money. So in the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy, my school is going to be based on six sciences. I don't have to mention language and history and civics and science because that's required by law. But on top of that, there's six sciences that I think all African children need and I don't see nobody, no school I've seen. And I travel to all of them. I just came from San Diego, LA, Mississippi. I'll leave you guys, I go to DC tomorrow. Then I go to Detroit, then I have Dallas next weekend, and then I go over to London, England again for the fifth time. Wherever I go, I've not seen the school that we need. I know some good ones. I know some good ones, even here in Philadelphia. I know some very good schools, but I haven't seen the blueprint school yet. I haven't seen the one where I say, that right there is what our children need. So I'm going to build it. And what are those six sciences? The first one is agricultural and agronomical science. Our children have to be taught from kindergarten how to grow crops, how to make your own string beans. And even if you live in inner city Philadelphia and you don't have a yard, you can turn that spare room into a garden and never have to shop for fruits and vegetables from the store again. Do you know that agribusiness is the number one business on the planet? Selling and growing food is the number one money maker on earth, more than gas and oil, and our children don't know how to grow. Look at me. I have six college degrees. I can't even grow a weed. <laughs> Never been taught how to work with my hands. And then we want to teach them financial and economic science because our people are money illiterate. We don't know anything about stocks and bonds. We don't know anything about multinational corporations. We don't know anything about investing in the resources of Africa. We don't know anything about the Chinese stock market, the South African stock market, or the Nigerian stock market, three of the most powerful in the world. Our children are going to be taught how to invest in fifth grade. When they graduate from 12th grade, they'll have a portfolio already. By the time your child's graduate, they will know how to cut hair or do hair. They will know how to take the computer apart, put it back together. They'll be able to produce their own documentary. Some of them will know how to fly airplanes because they're going to have an aviation academy. They can get their junior's pilot's license. Imagine that. When I was in Jackson yesterday, I met a sister who was going to hook me up with one of the uh, Tuskegee Airmen from Tuskegee University. He's retired now. He's going to help me build the aviation program for the school. Imagine that. Your son can fly planes at 17 years old. And then we want to have a maritime academy where we teach the sons and daughters how to float ships. And you say, well, what's so important about float ships? I don't like water. I'll tell you what's so important about float ships. 90% of all commercial enterprise is conducted on the sea, not by air. Everything you wear, eat, sell, buy, use, comes to you by ship, mostly. So black people cannot be serious about becoming an economic power if we don't own our own ships. When Marcus Garvey put the black star line on the water, you laughed at him. What is he doing with ships? Because Mr. 
already knew that if we want to become an economic power, we're going to have to deal with ships also. What's the third skill we want to teach them? Dietary and nutritional science. 85% of the diseases black people die from are preventable and related to how and what we eat. We got to teach them how to eat to live. And then we want to teach them political and military science. Say, so what does that mean? Political and military science. We want to teach them how to shoot rifles, how to use guns. You say, well, wait a minute, Dr. Luma, that sounds like a bit much. Well, Chuck will tell you, Chris is here, he'll tell you. We went to a school called Scotland School for Veterans Children. When I was in ninth grade, they took me to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, for officer strength. And it was real recruits in Fort Bragg. They took us out and sh showed us how to shoot machine guns. No blanks, real bullets. I was there with Wendell and Trace L and the rest of them with a real gun. They put that gun in our hands, put it under our arm, told us to make sure you don't put it on your collarbone because the force of the machine gun, when you shoot it, it'll break your shoulder bone if you don't tuck it right. And then one day, we learned how to shoot. If I could do that for the government, your son should learn how to shoot in case he ever has to defend his mother's life. In case he ever got to look out for his little sister. I don't ever want him to have to use it. But if he so needs to, he should know how to do so properly. Because martial law is coming to black America. You already see it. It is ruled by cops. They can kill who they want and walk away from it. So we want to teach political and military science how to live off the land, how to clean your urine if it ain't no water to drink, so you can drink it. That's what people do when they ain't got access to water. It's a technology to clean the urine. We're not being nasty, we're being real, listen. And then we got to teach them what? The science of the black man and the black woman. Your daughters are going to have to study the black man as a science. And your sons are going to study your daughters as a science. Her hormones, her menstrual, when she gets pregnant, what is the relationship between a woman and the moon? All of that. Because the first human symbol for God was not a cross or a moon and a star. It was the black woman herself. She was the first symbol ever used on earth for God. If you don't believe me, do your research. In fact, we call God a she for more than two million years before God was ever called he. Did you know that? You got some research to do. We used to call on the great cosmic mother. God didn't become a he until the European and the Arabs stole our Christianity and Islam and used it for their own purposes. God was a she. And that's why in African religion we refer to both God the mother and God the father depending on the aspect of the creator. If a woman is about to have a baby, we call on God the mother because that's a feminine aspect of divinity. If we got to go to war, we call on God the father because that's a masculine aspect of divinity. But it amazes me how black people, women in particular, have called on God the Father your whole life and you never even tap into your own feminine principle. So in my school, we also want to teach them traditional African spirituality. Nothing wrong with the Bible when it comes out. They want to learn that too. Better than you know. But then we want to teach them about the ancient African sciences. They want to learn about Ifai, Shemet, Dogan, and Akan. They want to learn about Saturday, Apollo, Ukumi, and that thing called Rukun that Hollywood told you was the devil's birth. Which is nothing but the worship of the Most High. They want to learn about all that spirit work. They want to learn about ancestor veneration and how we as African people always keep a relationship going with those in our family who pass on to the next life. Because in our culture, before there was anything called an angel, our angels were our ancestors, and they still are. Yeah. To Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey again. And to all my mothers in here, don't take offense. I don't want you to change nothing you do in your life. But when your daughters show up to the Anna Douglas and Amy Jakes and Ashwood Academy for Young Women, when your daughters come to my school for the first day, they cannot have a weave, wig, turn, straightening comb, hair color, extension, or nothing. You can keep yours. 
but she cannot have hers. And you say, well, Dr. Umar, what does my daughter's hair got anything to do with what you teach her? Science and how to fly. What does it have to do with her learning how to grow her own food? I'll tell you. If you don't teach black children to love themselves first, if I don't teach her knowledge yourself first, if she don't learn commitment to Philadelphia first, then she'll fly planes, but she'll fly them against Africa for the government. She'll grow food, but she'll grow for Monsanto against her own community. President Obama is a brilliant man. Condoleezza Rice is a brilliant woman. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas is a brilliant man. Michelle Obama is a brilliant woman. But because they weren't taught commitment to their community, their intelligence is used against you and not for you. And I will not allow none of your children to graduate my school, having learned my science, and go use it to the benefit of another people. And the beauty, and don't worry, I know how to cut hair. So she shows up and says, my mama didn't tell me, that's all right, baby, we will take care of you right now. <laughs> don't worry, I can put a little German town inside of her head if she want to rep her hood. But I'm not having none of that. We get rid of all that stuff. I need her to love herself as God made her. Okay? Nothing wrong with a nappy-headed black woman. And the beauty of that is what? Your sons go to a school where all the girls are natural. From kindergarten to 12th grade, which means he can only learn to love a natural headed black woman. Which means that by the time the young men become adults, all the women are gonna start going natural because they notice that the boys don't wanna be bothered with nothing that ain't. In fact, I'm gonna be listed in the World Book of Guinness Records. Let me tell you what, you're going to see my name in my school in the World Book of Guinness Records in 20 years. Mark my words. I'm going to be the first high school ever to have a senior class prom where every girl got a natural God-given hair on her head. The first one ever. But you know how we stack it for the prom. Stack, 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 stack. Stack, stack, stack. Where do you come to my prom? Every sister walking in, they're going to have a natural head and they're going to look beautiful. They're going to put the stacks to shame. Damn, I should have went natural. We got to teach them the love of sin there. And black men, you got to stop going outside your race for your queen. That don't make no sense. I know sisters got issues, we got issues. They can put up with us, you can put up with them. Mike Jordan, a couple of weeks ago, married, what, a 35, 36-year-old model? You in your 50s, and you married a 35-year-old white woman. Do y'all know what that means? That means whenever his ancestors called him back home, that $500 million he got goes to her and her people. And you can best believe she ain't going to take no check to Charlotte, North Carolina, and help the blacks in his neighborhood. That's why I'm against interracial marriage. Not because I got anything against white women, but I know that the black family is under extinction. That most of our new weddings and marriages are biracial or same sex. So the traditional family of a black man and a black woman, how often do you see that anymore? So we got to build it back up again. Who you marry is a political state. It ain't just emotional. Your wife tells me who you really are, who you really love, who you really wish you were. And that's not knocking. We all marry the white women. I've got friends who married the white women. They understand politically. I don't agree with this stuff. But I respect you and your family. I wouldn't take a father from his children. You got children with a white woman, you got to stay there because those children need their mother and their father in the same room. I can't split up that family. And he chooses to do whatever he wants to do, but I cannot do it. He shouldn't have done it, but it's done now. You've got to raise those babies. But raise those biracial children with an African consciousness. Because our biracial children are often used against 
us. Because the black father is afraid to tell them they black and the white mother don't want to accept they black. And I know this for a fact. I got friends who are, they got women who are raising a jet black boy as white when you know he ain't going to be accepted as white because you don't want to accept the fact that a baby would not be. But what you have one for? But it's our responsibility not to treat them differently because they catch enough hell. Biracial African children have a serious issue because they don't never quite feel black and the white folk will never quite treat them as. So we want to get ready to take a break. And then when we come back from that break, how long that break wanna be? When we keep rolling? We almost done. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go for 15 no minutes, 10 15, and then I'll be done for the day. I'm gonna hit some of these slide questions real quick. But my point is, y'all, public education is about to be a thing of the past. And we got to be ready for when those schools are going all together. When I was in Jackson, Mississippi, guess what I learned? The day I got to Jackson, they said that the charter school bill just got approved in the state assembly in Mississippi. You've been had charter schools in Pennsylvania. They just got them. And guess what I told my brothers and sisters in Mississippi yesterday? I said, white supremacy is about to take over Jackson. I said, they mad that Attorney Lumumba, this powerful Pan-Africanist, was elected mayor. Jackson is the capital of Mississippi, and these white folks are pissed off that their capital city is all black, run by a black man. So they have decided that they're going to take it back. And what they want to use as a battering ram? The charter school. And guess what else? I was invited by the president of Jackson State University to join her up in the president's suite to watch Jackson State versus Texas Southern. That was actually my first black, black HBC football game. And I loved it, because I never saw the drum line loud, and they did it just like the movie. I'm so mad I never went to a black school. For all my young people who ain't in college yet, make sure you go to a black school, either for undergrad or for grad. But parents, make sure they get that experience because I was so jealous sitting up in that room for just seeing the students and the culture and the pride of going to an HBCU. I know our HBCUs got problems. I know Lincoln and Cheney got problems. I know some of them got young men walking around with skirts and high heels. I know that. They got problems. But had it not been for the HBCU, you wouldn't have had the doctors you got now. Had it not been for the HBCU, you wouldn't have had the lawyers, half the engineers, half the teachers. They need some work, but we got to protect them because they trying to kill them. Y'all know that. They want the white universities to come in and annex the HBCUs. Because y'all said that now since President Obama is in office, we don't need black schools. Some of y'all said we don't need Black History Month. Do you know, as I wrap up, that you the reason George Zimmerman was acquitted. Not the jury, not the prosecution, not the defense, not the judge, not you! Black people created the atmosphere that allowed George Zimmerman to walk by buying into a post-racial America. Half the black men in Philadelphia can't find a job, but race don't exist no more. Black men going to jail like it ain't no tomorrow. Not even Hispanics go to jail at the same rate as black men. But you say race don't matter. 93% of all the women teaching your kids in public, private, charter, and parochial school are white women. Special educating your sons, but race don't matter. You know what your problem is? You scared to be unapologetically African. You scared to be what God gave you. When a Jew walks into the room, he walks into the room as a Jew. He don't want to be nothing else, and he wants you to know I'm a Jew. When the Italian walks into the room, he walks in with his history and his culture, his whole race is with him. When the Chinese man walks into the room, he commands respect because of the respect China get. And when you walk into the room, you want to be everything else but yourself. A people who don't respect themselves aren't worthy of being respected by anyone. Thank you.
go through the slides another time. And that'll be a whole other three hours. But you'll get the book, and most of the slide is in the book anyway. Let me say this. I have a three-year plan to build my school. First year was publication of my book to let you know why we need it. That's done. Second year, August the 21st of 2014, my 40th birthday. I'm going to release in the movies a documentary to support the book called The Shockumentary, America's War Against Black Boys. If any of you here have a testimonial that you want and that you're willing to be interviewed, to give, to offer, for my made for the movies doc. Now don't say it if you're scared of white people. But if you got a testimony, somebody did something to your son and it wasn't right. Somebody did something to your nephew and it wasn't right. For my young black men in the room, some of y'all got a testimony. Some of y'all might want your kids to tell their own story. You ain't got to be a man, you can be a woman. You can be a teacher, you can be a member of the community, you can be a pastor, you can just be an everyday black person who saw something happen to one of our young black males in school that you didn't like. Some of y'all got kids who been misdiagnosed. Some of y'all got kids suffering from the side effects of Ritalin that nobody told you would even happen. If you got a testimonial for my movie, I'm going to give you my phone number right now. So take your cell phones out, take your pens out, and all you have to do is text me three words. Your first name, the city you live in, and the word Shockumentary. So if I was texting myself, it would be Umar, Philadelphia, Shockumentary. That's all I need. And then I would be in contact with you to schedule the interview. I got different folks around the country going to help me out with this because I'm new to videography and documentary filming. But this is necessary because I saw Wait for, wait for Superman. Y'all saw Wait for Superman? That was a bunch of garbage that did not tell the truth of what's happening to our boys, so I'm going to tell it. Their phone number is 215-989-9858. Again, 215-989-9858. That's my cell phone. It comes to me. Okay? Ladies, don't be sending me no obscene pictures. Because I'm not going to look at them. But anyway... Y'all are best. In conclusion, if any of y'all have any issues regarding your children, okay, if any of y'all have any paperwork today you need to look at, I'll look at it today. I don't need to see the IEP, I need to see the evaluation. Any advice, if it has to do with mental health and education for children, I'm the person you come to. You can email me if you need to email me at Dr. Umar Johnson at Yahoo. That's D R U M A R Johnson at yahoo.com, Dr. Umar Johnson at Yahoo. My website is drumarjohnson.com. If you're on Twitter, you can follow me at Dr. Umar Johnson. If you're on Facebook, I use my African last name for Facebook, so you won't find me under Johnson. You have to look up Dr. Umar Ifatunde, and I'll spell Ifatunde for my Facebook people. That's I-F-A, Ifa. T as in tall, U as in unity, N as in nationalism, P as in dedication, E as in early. Dr. Umar Ifat Tunde on Facebook. Okay? I'm going to leave y'all with a quote from my ancestor, Frederick Douglass. On my father's side, I'm related to Frederick Douglass. I'm still digging up some history on my mama's side. And I got my Aunt Trudy here today. My brother Ali back there came to support me. But Frederick Douglass said this. And by the way, there's a movie coming out on the life of Frederick Douglass. First full length feature movie. It is, he's going to be played by Keith David. The smooth talking brother who played in Barbershop, Platoon, Dead President. He's going to play Frederick Douglass. And I was asked to serve as a historical consultant on the movie. It's a couple years in the making, though. Don Cheadle is working on the movie for Marcus Garvey right now. I just hope it's done well. Frederick said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess the faith of freedom and deprecate agitation are like men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain but can't stand the thunder or the lightning. They want the ocean but can't deal with the awful roar of its waters. 
He said the struggle we have might be moral or it might be physical. Or it might be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. He said, find out what any people will quietly submit to. And you have found the exact measure of injustice that will be used against them. He said, for 20 years I prayed on my knees to God for freedom. But my Lord gave me no freedom until I got up off my knees and started praying with my feet. He said, if we are to be free, then we ourselves must strike the first blow. He said, the limits of tyrants are prescribed by the people who they oppress. He said, a people who won't fight for themselves aren't worth being fought for by nobody else. He said, if a man is laying on the ground and he ain't got guts enough to stand on his own two feet, leave him. Because if you pick him up, he's going to fall back down anyway. So you didn't help him, you hurt him. He said, most of all, you remember this, that power can seize nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Some of y'all have young children. Please don't think that going to college is a rite of passage. You should only send your children to college if they meet three criteria. Number one, you know that you gave them the self-discipline necessary to finish. A lot of you are raising some lazy, shiftless kids. Why in the hell are you sending them to college? If he can't get up to go to school in your house, what makes you think he want to do it 300 miles away at Penn State University? If you didn't give him self-discipline, and you do know that's your number one responsibility, raising a black boy, to teach him discipline. And what is discipline? It's the ability to teach your son how to do what needs to be done when it got to be done, whether he likes it or not. And he ain't got that. Don't send him to school. So the first requirement, make sure he won't finish. Second requirement, make sure he majoring in something that equals a job when he get out. Some of your children are getting doctorate degrees in grasshopper reproduction on the moon during the winter. <laughs> now you might graduate summa cum laude, but can I ask you a question? Who is looking for somebody to give a job to who got a PhD in grasshopper reproduction on the moon during the winter? Y'all get my point, don't y'all? Make sure it equals a job in the third thing. So first, discipline. The second, make sure they want to have a job when they get out. And the third thing is make sure you're going to do drive-bys when you get to college. Do you know what a drive-by is? That's when your daughter got a 9 o'clock math class that you don't think she's likely to get to. You want to drive on by, make sure her ass is in. Your son got a 6 o'clock history class. He don't do 6 o'clock at night. You want to drive by his dorm room and make sure he in it by himself because too many of our kids are going to college and coming home with babies instead of degrees. What's wrong with being an electrician, a plumber, a carpenter? What's wrong with being an auto mechanic with an auto body repair? What's wrong with being a barber or an HVAC specialist? What's wrong with being a woodworker or a heating, cooling, and air conditioning expert? You don't have to send your children to college if they don't want to go. They have to go to trade school, but they ain't got to go to college. There's a trade school in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania called Thaddeus Stevens College of Technology. You should check it out. Half the kids who go, go for free, and most of them go on full scholarship. Your son or daughter could come home in two years certified, open their own business. No college debt. Marcus Garvey was once asked, are you an African or are you a Jamaican? Are you an African or are you a Jamaican? Are you an African or are you a Jamaican? And in response to that question, His Excellency, Arthur Messiah Garvey, leader of the largest black organization in modern history, the man who gave us the red, black, and green flag, and who also gave you Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad, Dr. King, and a whole bunch of other people, said that I would never give up a continent for an island. I am an African. Yesterday, today, and for all time. I share. Thank you, brothers and sisters. If you get the book, I will give you something for you well. Thank you. Oh, from that break, give our brother another round of applause. Good hand in back in terms of the round of applause. Hold up, don't go yet. Um, we got a pack of freedom ready for you. We're going to have to pass it back to the friend over here. Y'all sit down. Sit down, sit down, sit down. We got the book. Um, in a minute, um, Dr. Omar is going to... Um, I'm um, signing this book.
But uh, thank you all uh, so much for coming for the plea, you know, support. Uh, our ministry here came in, we got the back in the back, and whatever you can get, get it, ain't no fee. Um, so anybody have any questions for Dr. Johnson? Any, any, any questions? Are you coming back? Oh, you'll be in the back side of the Dr. Johnson. Come on. Dr. Johnson. Do you have any questions or remarks for Dr. Yes, my sister. Uh, uh, Assistance for the school. How can I help with the school? There's a couple of things. First, someone just asked me, uh, if you need, listen up, I will be back there soon to sign, and if you need to pay with a credit card, I can do it on my phone. The t-shirts are only for ladies. They're unapologetically African t-shirts, they're fitted t-shirts, but I only have ladies. I didn't have a chance to get the fellas done. And then the DVDs. The DVDs, there's different titles, relationships, miseducation, all kind of stuff is back there. Then of course the books, but I'll be back there soon. How can you help me with the school? Send me an email and let me know you're interested. Now there's something I need to tell you, because y'all my Philadelphia family. Uh, Please take a seat, brothers and sisters. Mr. Harrison would like everyone to take a seat until we've done the Q&A. Please come and uh, grab a seat real quick. Let's do it the right way. Come grab a seat. I got to be honest with y'all. I got to be honest with y'all. When I go to other cities, I get a reception there for my work that I don't get here at all. When I go to Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles, Texas, South Florida, D.C., it's standing room only, and the people are ready to build that school. Over the next three months, I have to make a serious decision, and that is whether I'm going to stay here and do it, or whether I'm going to go somewhere else. Now, the Bible says, Christ said that a prophet is never accepted in his own home. It may be the case that I got to go. Dr. King was born in Atlanta, but he had to go to Birmingham to make his mark. Malcolm was born in Michigan, but he had to go to Boston to do it. Farrakhan the Islands, but he had to come here. Mr. Muhammad, Georgia, but he had to come to Detroit. Garvey, Jamaica, but he had to come to New York. And I don't compare myself to them, but the point is, there's something about doing things at home that you don't get the love because you get taken for granted. So I'm saying this, if y'all are interested in building that school here in Philadelphia, then I need to hear from you. Email me, text me, and in the next month or so, probably the next two weeks, I'm going to have a meeting. For those who are really, don't come if you're not serious, but for those who are really serious, I'm going to have a meeting and see the type of support I got here in Philly. And if I got the support, I'll stay. But if I don't, it looks like Detroit and Chicago is going to be my destination. Because the love I get in Chicago, Detroit, I don't get it nowhere else. So, y'all home, and I would love nothing more than to build that Frederick Bellis Marcus Garvey School here. Lord knows we got the empty schools to do it. But I can't do it by myself. And I've been struggling for a long time to Philly, and I've been dealing with a lot of bourgeois, and a lot of y'all ain't been standing by my side. I'm just being real. So if y'all want me to stay here, show me that love. If I don't get it, you can best believe. Last week, packed, I'm on my way. I've always loved Philly. I've always come here. My mom's here. My children here. My family here. But I just want to make that clear to y'all that I am. I will consider staying. But if I don't get that support, I will have to move on. All right, thank you, Dr. Van. We are preparing right now. We're going to bring our our fearless leader, real African brother here. Uh, another question? Yes. Um, um, I have a diagnosis to help the child. You don't. The diagnosis is for the psychologist to get paid. I want to say that again. The 
you bring a child to me with depression or a reading problem, I don't need to diagnose them with a reading disability to help them. I don't need to diagnose them with depression to be there. The diagnosis is for money reasons. Is everybody clear? It's about the money. Now, as far as getting them tested, I think assessment, academic assessment, is necessary in serves a place. IQ tests do not tell us how smart anybody is. IQ tests were designed to justify the marginalization of black children. I'm going to go back to my earlier statement in that the test scores can benefit a parent. For example, I do a lot of testing in the home. If any of y'all need your children tested, Dr. Wu, I don't know what my child is really reading at. Is he reading on the ninth grade level? I can do that. But to ask the school to do a psychological evaluation, they're looking to diagnose the child, and there's no solution in that. So my point is, does testing serve a purpose? Yes, but it should only be considered one small part of a larger assessment of what your child can do. Uh, parents, y'all want to supplement the child's education, make them read more? I'm going to tell you right now, the reason our children are not doing well on the tests because they don't have the working vocabulary to understand the questions. This black-white testing is a hoax. Let me give you an example. This is a math question. Your child reads it. He doesn't understand the way it's being asked. If it was asked another way, he would get it and get it right. But what they do is they deliberately use technology with the words that they ask the questions with to throw the black kids off. So how do we fight that? Make sure your child is reading at least three grades above their grade level. Take them to the library, get them the books, turn off the TV. In fact, you can just throw that away. Because most of your children are technology slaves. They whole day is cell phone, internet, TV, and video game. Do you know how much time they can be spending reading, writing, and proving a math skill? But we just got a whole bunch of technology slave babies with no type of skills. So what you got to do is turn off the TV and work with them in reading comprehension. Work with your children on their reading comprehension skills because our children are struggling being able to pull meaning from the text because that is a skill that's not being taught well in the schools at all. The other thing, don't let nobody tell you your child got ADHD when they go to a school that they got no air condition when it's warm or no heat when it's cold. And make sure you send your child to school with a good night rest and breakfast. And I'm not talking about that sugar cereal. It amazes me how many kids are on medicine who eat sugar all day, ain't got a recess in school, no gym class. And then they want to put them on drugs. If you really want to see if your child got an ADHD problem, first you got to do a sugar detox. That's three months with no sugar, caffeine, high fructose corn syrup. Now most of y'all look at me like I'm crazy when I say that. You know why? Because you addicted to sugar. And he can't get off because you ain't ready to get off. In fact, the biggest drugstore is the supermarket. Most of your shopping carts, 80% sugar. So what you got to do is detox them off the sugar. They don't need drugs. Drugs don't solve the problem. Drugs will make the problem worse. They can cause stroke, diabetes, epilepsy, tick disorder, schizophrenia, mess with the, the kidneys, heart, liver, uh, stroke. It messes with his ability to have children when he gets older. It kills his brain cells, stunts his growth. In fact, a lot of our boys are going bald. Boom, bald headed at 10 years old. Side effect of the drug. Some of your sons were supposed to be six feet tall. They were be three feet tall because of the drugs. The problem is we're not spending time with our children like we used to. And we just put them on drugs because we don't want to be bothered. Spend the time with your child. You made them so raise them. Stop giving to the white psychiatrist a pill for money. Good sister. Brother, let me say first my comment quick question. I want to say to you that you are the most inspiring, giving, and courageous African Thank
going to be comment about the RTS, the residential treatment facilities, the group homes and the other push-out homes that are also draining the money. Because I just have to sign every year because my sons went to these special needs schools that weren't charter, weren't public schools. So if you could talk a little bit about the RTS, if you know, the RTS that they're going to, and then they're going back into the group homes, those who are doctor or foster care, going back into the group homes, which undermine pretty much everything else, which I want to talk to you about later. Too. For the residential treatment school, you know, we have a lot of them, but most of our kids don't go to RTS, they go to the alternative discipline school, which most of them have been taken back now. So you had the CEP, I remember CEPs, I think they got some other ones now. They also take money. So you're, you're absolutely correct. You know, the RTS, the uh, the discipline school, most of them were started by prison companies, by the way. You know, uh, so yeah, they also drain money. You know, but they don't compare in terms of size and number with the charters in terms of financial. But they are also, the bottom line is this, and this is why I had a lot of respect for Dr. Arlene Ackerman. She wasn't perfect. And she did try to play the game, and me and her had her differences. But she cared about the children. And the reason they booted her out is because she tried to make white women do their damn jobs. And she tried to share those contracts with black people. And Michael Nutter stabbed her in the back and got her on out. And of course we know she passed on, and that's a little suspicious. Because last time I seen it, she was doing well. Not to say there wasn't something going on, but you don't go that fast even if you say it. I've known people who had problems, they don't go that fast. Okay, so I'm starting to wonder whether my sister knew something that they didn't want her to share with somebody else. Because we know the school district of Philadelphia has never yet opened their investment books to see who actually makes the money off the investments of the school district. The school district is a hustle. White folks are robbing our kids blind, and black folks are helping them. Darrell Clark, number one, big sellout. Michael Nutter, most of your state reps are in there with these corporations. They help them take over your city, and all you do is keep on real life. Real life. Well, the black person is better than the white person. Well, if the black person knows you automatically going to vote for them, and if the white person knows you ain't going to vote for them, neither one of them do nothing for you. We have to stop this loyalty to a black elected official. Feel loyalty to your community, not to these people. Same thing with Obama. The reason why the president did nothing for black people is because you didn't ask him to. People said, why did he give the homosexuals a Supreme Court justice? Why did he give the Latinos a Supreme Court justice? Why is he fighting for illegal immigrants? Because these people made that a condition of their vote. And you out here dancing in the street talking about this is Dr. King's dream coming from Phil. Man won't even recognize you exist. He can cry tears for everybody else's kids. I'm in Chicago twice a month. I speak in Chicago more than every other city where he allegedly used to help. He's done nothing for Chicago. Kids being murdered every day. They even call Chicago Shy Rat Illinois. When Sandy Hook happened, he didn't wait to go cry with those white kids' parents. Black kids down in Chicago every day. And I know some of y'all love the president because you can't see beyond his skin color. But you better wake up to the reality of the bourgeoisie. Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, Barack Obama, you better know who you're dealing with. They are not for you. And it's a shame because these young children are going to have to deal with the fact that you let a president go eight years in a White House, as bad as your condition is, and not ask them to do nothing. You ain't asked them to fix the schools. You ain't asked them to hire more black male teachers. You ain't asked them to do anything about the criminal law that disproportionately attacks black people. We just have it. So the white person give you a black person that you contain. Come on, y'all. We've been at this too long. We should know better than that.